So let's lay out the die. So we're going to use this blade. Um, first thing you do before you cut your block is to set up the blade. If you got a new blade, you want to flatten the back. Well, we can see here this one's due for some maintenance. We just about lost the flat. So I'm going to have to get in there and flatten that out. Um, also, and usually if you've got a new blade, this won't be a problem. It's a pretty good match, but this section of the blade from here to here and from that corner to the side of the blade is the portion of the blade that's captured by the block. That's what holds the blade in place. And so you don't want the edge to go back in. This is that area there. You don't want the blade to be back in here because it'll start to cut chips. And then it'll clog up in there. So after you flatten the back, sharpen the bevel. If you need to narrow the blade to the width of the chip breaker, which is essentially the width of the blade, the width of this opening, uh, you can do that by grinding slightly these back to reduce that blade width. Flatten the back, sharpen the bevel, prepare the chip breaker, which is basically, if you've got a low quality chip breaker, you may have to do this bevel. And there's a secondary bevel on the chip breaker. Um, it's about 60 degrees to the line of cut. A uh, higher angle blade, it's going to be less, 40 degree uh, angle blade, it's definitely going to be about 60 degrees. That's pretty high. And, the, and that needs to be sharpened on your finest stone and backed off and sharpened just like the blade. And then as we talked about earlier, you can test for the two ears and adjust those so you get a nice flat fit to the blade. So, uh, yeah, I used to make uh, planes fairly frequently. I've uh, just about uh, prepared every one I think I need at this point. Uh, so, I have made up little jigs. This is essentially uh, a bigger piece of wood. I'll put a saw cut in it, trim the, this is actually boxwood, um, trimmed uh, a little rabbit on the boxwood to exactly fit in there, made a long blank, this is about 12 or 16 inches long, and then cut off these pieces at the angles that I want to use them for. Um, also can use this kind of thing for dovetails. It's a one and seven dovetail. This is square. This is strictly for making planes and I have a few others with the dovetail marking on. Japanese planes uh, are not um, described by degrees. They're described by a ratio uh, with a base of 10. So a 45 degree blade is going to be a 10 in 10 pitch. The 40 degree blade, which is the most common uh, angle you will see in the Japanese planes, that's 8 and 10. Uh, 11 and 10 is 47 and a half degrees. And uh, we're doing a 9 and 10. which is this one. Uh, 9 and 10 and 11 and 10 are two of my favorite angles, 43 and a 47 and a half. And the lower one is for uh, hardwoods, medium hardwoods. The 47 and a half is uh, very good for the harder hardwoods such as walnut and so forth. Uh, this one uh, originally was 9 and 10 and that's what I'm going to make the new one at. So uh, this base 10 thing, um, the scale in the Japanese measurement is, uh, is feet, but the foot is divided into 10 divisions rather than 12. The foot, however, is very, very close to the imperial foot. So uh, most of the ratios and layouts are done in, in uh, a base of 10. <clears throat> 
So the overall proportions of a block is often, uh, of a finished plane, is often three width, five length. Um, and also the uh, setback of the blade is often at three-fifths of the length. So let's start there. Now our, you can see I cut that old block up. We still have the maker's mark on there. Uh, it turns out this end isn't quite square, but that means I'd have to cut that mark off. I'm kind of sentimentally attached to <clears throat> the origins of this block. And we have a shake in here. This is a drying crack. This may spell disaster in the long run for, the, for this die. But I'm going to go ahead uh, and see how far that runs and if it interferes with our work. <clears throat> so you want the bark side down. So this means your growth rings are going to be curving like that. And these always have rays. You'll see the rays here. You want them radiating out from what will be the top of the plane. The sides a little more. Usually if there's any grain you can detect it runs at this angle. Uh, seems to be less critical to me. So the dimensions of the block. Basically the block has to be 3 eighths to 5 eighths overall. Uh, wider than the blade. This is so that you have at least 3 sixteenths quarter inch or so on either side of the blade, a little bit more on the bigger planes, to make the block strong enough to resist the wedging uh, action of the blade itself. Um, now it's somewhat standardized on the bigger finished planes that the width is about 30% of the length. Um, or so, or you could say that uh, the length is three times the width of the blade. This one's going to be a little bit shorter because I cut it out of a salvaged piece. Uh, the original one was uh, six and a half inches. This one is six inches. And the thickness, basically at your angle, you want to be, it has to be thick enough to about capture all the hardened steel. Most of it anyway. Uh, the, if you look at the older uh, planes, they've been flattened several times. They're getting quite thin, but oftentimes the blade's been sharpened quite a bit, and so it's, it's shrunk down. So you need uh, uh, enough meat there to grab that um, blade. So with this uh, inch and three quarter blade, I've got a die that's one inch thick. Um, and two and five sixteenths wide and six inches which is kind of what we got left of the salvage. The blade is set back about um, three-fifths the length. Um, that's not set in stone uh, especially with the really shorter um, planes you want the, the cutout you don't want that cut out to get too far back. You need enough to support the blade. You don't really want the blade hanging out the back. It should be in from the back. So um, the calculations on this is it's uh, about three and five eighths for a six inch plane. And uh, let's just do this so I don't make my mistake. So mark that on the bottom. Not deathly critical. Critical to hit that dead on. We we'll use the shorter square, just because it's a little less awkward on this small piece.
we'll take our angle. Now you could uh, use a bevel gauge for this and just set it off a protractor. Like I said, I've done this several times, so I've made up uh, little marking tools. So, this is the blade line, blade edge. That's our starting point. So our blade edge will start right on there. Do the other one. Yep, 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 yep. There we go. Connect the two lines. And then we will do the, um, we'll use this. You can freehand set this on this line and it would probably be more convenient to have this piece in the vise, but basically set that blade on there. And I like to um, set it back a little bit so it gives me a little extra play. And you mark a line on the back there. Now you can take the bevel gauge and extend that line. Let's do it this way. Do the bottom. Let's, uh, let's do it here. Now this may not quite align just because of the wedge shape. We could have it in a slightly different position. And let's see how close that comes. Yeah, not too bad. Yeah, not too bad. Let's extend this line. And we put it across the... Okay. Now, the um, chip well here, the angle of the uh, throat, usually about 10%. That is also not cast in stone. It can be greater if you got a, uh, a single edge plane without a chip breaker. That's that mark right there. And then um, I've got the throat mark there on that. And usually we give it about a oh, quarter inch, heavy quarter, five sixteenths. And just bring that up. Connect the dots across. Just so that's that. Now we mark the width of the blade. This blade is tapered in its width, so we'll do it at about this point here. 
just to eyeball it because we're going to have to shave, uh, probably do some paring in there. Let's double check that. Mm -hmm, it's fine. Now the chip well, which is the width of the chip breaker. Again, centered in here. So. So, well this is the opening at the top. We actually do need to mark the chip breaker with here. And for the time being, our cut will actually be from here to here. So. So you don't need too many uh, tools for this. You need a chisel, bevel edge, or square edge chisel. Uh, ideally, it should be a little more than twice the width of the opening we're dealing here. Um, if you have a chisel that's full width, uh, there's a certain complexity to the bed. Uh, you really want to have two chisel strokes in here. You can use this for pairing later, uh, some surfaces. If it's too wide, the first cut that you make has a great deal more resistance than the second cut, and this is uh, kind of uh, distracting, shall we say. You can work around it, but it's better that if the resistance is pretty similar when you make these two cuts and that they overlap, and you can follow uh, the first stroke um, by the contrast of the reveal of the rabbit, the slight rabbit that's left, uh, or whether or not it's dead on with the first cut, which is ideally what you want. Um, you'll need a saw, a keyhole saw at least. This works pretty well. Uh, here we have a saw, a homemade saw made specifically for the purpose it was shown to me by the guy who showed me how to make the um, Japanese planes. This is basically a saber saw. Two pieces of wood. The saber saw is let into the wood the same shape as that lock-on key end that they have. And then the two pieces of wood are glued back together. The top of the blade has been relieved here so I can get deep in there and see, uh, see how the cut is progressing. Keyhole saw works fine. Um, you'll find if you're doing several of these or over time that you know, you'll, and be aware of it when you're making it this time, that this can flex a little bit uh, when you're trying to make the cut and throw the cut off. So you have to concentrate on that. You'll need a narrow chisel, one that's narrow enough to go in and clear out the, um, blade slot there. Um, this one is about, I think it's a three millimeter. I do have, I like this one because this one is just as wide as the thinnest part of the blade and so it gets bound up a little bit down in the slot. So um, I like to use an eighth of an inch uh, chisel. This is a antique Japanese mortise chisel, probably a millimeter and a half, two millimeters. Uh, probably half its original length. It was probably about that long originally. It was all rusted 
like this all over when I got it, but when I cleaned it up, it was very excellent steel underneath. Uh, it's uh, surprisingly comfortable, and by the amount of wear on the blade, someone spent a lot of time handling this blade. Uh, very close relationship with that tool. And of course, you could always use the marples. You don't have to use Japanese chisels. This is the marple I have. Handy, but not necessary, is a butterfly chisel. Sometimes to get into some of the corners just at the bottom of the cut and clean them out. And as to setup, you don't need to clamp or dog the block because you're going to be moving it constantly. It's the most efficient way to work. Clamping it down, you'll have to clamp and unclamp. It'll take you four times as long. Um, I've got this set up, so you work against the dog. Whatever style of dog your bench has, I have the classic European bench dogs here with the tail vise. Uh, in this case, I've got a sacrificial piece hooked underneath the head of the dog there. And that's because when you're doing the final cuts down through the throat, you'll cut into your bench. You can see what it does. Um, here's some marks here for, from some uh, planes I made earlier before I found a piece of scrap to make the sacrificial uh, surface there. So what you want to do is start vaguely in the middle, kind of equidistant from your what will be your final cuts there. It's not critical, but kind of in here someplace. And it's important that you make all your cuts very clean, meeting exactly uh, as you progress. This will help you um, keep your cuts uh, parallel with your layout lines, which is really critical. Now, we'll start the cuts with bevel down. And we'll open quite a bit of this with the bevel down. That's more difficult with the bevel down to find a parallel with our finish lines. But as we approach the lines, we'll, we'll do it bevel up. And I find if you make all the cuts bevel up, and some of the makers do, but they're experienced, and they also have square edge chisels, like a firmer chisel. These bevel edge chisels, if they're uh, making a deep cut, two things will happen. They'll wedge in there, this kind of keystone shape. And a lot of these are relieved at the slight angle here. This is not necessarily square to the, the back of the chisel. Forms a keystone, and you'll drive it into the waist, and it, that will lock your chisel in there. The other thing that happens is there's a great deal of pressure from the bevel pushing the chisel one way or another. And it's very easy, as that's driven in deeply into the wood, for the bevel to rotate the chisel and make a deeper cut than you anticipated. And this is a classic uh, mistake, making too heavy a cut with the bevel down. So we'll talk a little bit more about uh, layout lines and working to them as we go along. All right, so we'll start approximately uh, in the middle where we talked about a good 16th in from the layout lines because you'll find as you're concentrating on falling uh, parallel to your uh, layout lines there that you might drive the chisel a little left and right. You need a little cushion space here. We'll come back and clean that up. Trying to keep it in there. So relatively clean, don't leave a lot of chewy stuff in there. Uh, you finish the cut, start the new cut on the same side to reduce the rotating the piece a little bit. Now, 
this point I'm just opening the cut up and uh, we could make these cuts a little steeper now because if you look at the layout lines on the side you can see that the front of the chip well is pretty steep take a look we're actually relatively you want to try and look down this line and look down this line and see if they appear parallel now I'm not sure this is the right position for the camera but that's what you're looking for right now that looks relatively parallel to that this however quite a bit shallower so Now, remember I said that this first cut here was pretty parallel. If you pay attention, you'll see that my new cut is not parallel. You can look at that. One of the reasons why you use uh, cut across this twice. So, uh, we can cut this again. Get it started here. see now it's pretty parallel relatively parallel we're pretty close there let's clean this out down we can So, we're still a little shallow, not quite parallel to that. I'm going to work in here. We got a little ridge left from jump of the chisel. Let's start in there. Deepen that cut a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to go bevel up here, start making some of these cuts parallel. I'm going to continue cutting here because I got a ways to go. The bevel down. Check this. 
pretty good. Let's clean this out. Okay. The Japanese oak is very good. It's cutting some uh, dyes and white oak earlier. And you know, white oak can be quite hard. This is much harder. Come on. 